Okay. Shalom, everyone. Type a one in the room if you can hear me. Okay, that's good. Okay, so welcome to another Thursday night Psalm study, and we're on Psalm 78. We finally got the part two. I had to break up part one and part A and B because it was so long. And um, the study's really long. I posted a link in the room at matsadi.com. And uh, we're, uh, we are down on... Oops, let me see here. I think it's page 32. Give me a second. <clears throat> yeah, bottom of page 32. You can download that from the website. Okay, so... Before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have shown us. Lord, I ask that you would touch those who are sick, that you would heal them speedily and uh, for your glory. Lord, we ask that you would speak to hearts tonight as we study your word and we study your evident commentary. Help us apply your word and your truths to our lives, Lord, for your glory. We pray all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, so uh, we are on page 32 in the study, and um, in Midrash Tehillim has 21 parts. That was, it was really long. And so, reading through the Midrashim in Psalm 78, I thought we would talk about part 1, 4, 6, 8, 18, and 21. And on page 32, 33, 34... I outlined the Midrashim in a typical fashion. Okay, so in Midrash Tehillim 78, Part 1, it opens with the Debor Hamat heel, the opening phrase, and it says, A maskil of Asaph, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. And then the homiletic introduction to the Midrash, it, st it states that these words are to be considered in light of what Scripture says elsewhere only take heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently lest you forget the things that your eyes saw the day that you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb and the rabbis are quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 9 through 10 and so um, when reading the homiletic introduction the, the question I had was what does it mean to take heed to yourself and to keep your soul what do you think? What what does it mean to take heed to yourself and keep your soul? Now the rabbis they're quoting from Deuteronomy chapter four verses nine through ten to draw our attention and place special emphasis on the worship of the Lord is to be conducted within uh, without the use of images, and this is what draws the distinction between the God of Israel from with regard to the other nations. And uh, within these verses, we are told the importance of teaching our children the Word of God, something of which seems to have been neglected in Israel, indicated by the very next generation failing to obey the Lord, rising up and not knowing the works the Lord had done for Israel, as we read in Judges chapter 2, verse 10. The idea of taking heed and keeping the soul is connected to studying God's Word for the purpose of remembering what he has done for us. And the experiences of the nation of Israel recorded in the Torah is meant not only for that generation, but also for all of the generations to come. And it is for this reason that the prophets in the Psalms call upon their contemporaries to remember what had, what had happened to Israel long ago according to God's Torah. And this is why the writers of the apostolic writings call upon the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, like which Paul says in Romans chapter 1 in his appeal of the gospel message you know, and um, to the Romans, and that to remember the promises of God and his mercies that are bestowed upon his children. Now the Midrash, it states, and it continues, and it says, The Holy One, blessed be he, made a covenant with the children of Israel only for the sake of the Torah, that it might not be forgotten out of their mouths. As scripture says, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel to the, to the end that it will not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. So the rabbis say that the Lord made a covenant with Israel for the sake of the Torah that would not be forgotten out of their mouths. And again, this is an obvious conclusion based upon the Torah text from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, 
to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, and your strength. And according to the Midrash and the conclusion of Asaph in the Psalm, we read in the Targum in Psalm 85 verses 5 through 7 the following. It says, And he established a witness among those of the house of Jacob, and he decreed a Torah among those of the house of Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their sons, so that another generation, sons still to be born, should know that they will arise and tell it to their children, and they will place their hope in God and not forget the works of God, and they will keep his commandments. So, one of the purposes of the covenant is to remember God's word and to not forget. And the Midrash continues, and it says, Now, in order that no man should say to you, the Psalms of David are not Torah, whereas, in fact, they are Torah, as the book of the prophets are also Torah, Therefore it is said, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching, my Torah. You know, it's Asaph saying in the beginning of the psalm. And not only the revelations, but even the riddles and the parables, they are also Torah. Hence, the Holy One, blessed be he, gave his admonition to Ezekiel, the son of man, put forth a riddle and speak a parable. And Solomon admonished to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise, no, wait, sorry. Okay, yeah, I read that right. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Therefore, Asaph goes on to say, I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter dark sayings concerning the days of old. It was asked of Asaph, Whence do you know what you speak of? Have you perhaps seen it? And he answered, I know it from hearing it as is said in the next verse, that which we have heard and know. Okay. And so notice how the Midrash states that some people may say that the Psalms of David are not Torah. However, the rabbis believe that the Psalms are Torah. And this gives credence to the understanding that Torah is God's instruction for his people. We discussed a couple weeks ago, I had, um, I had written on the uh, understanding that Torah means instruction, and specifically that it is the instruction of God to his people, you know, a way of life the way in which God expects us to live our lives before him. And that all of scripture can be categorized as Torah, as the instruction of God. And so I feel that the, the Midrash here in part one is substantiating or giving credence to this idea that all of scripture is a reference to the Torah of God, to the instruction of God. And this is a very rabbinic way of saying that, or of understanding that all of the scripture is inspired by God. The rabbis say that even the riddles and the parables are for instruction and teaching. Examples are given from Ezekiel, Solomon, and Asaph saying that he will open his mouth with dark sayings concerning the days of old. And the point of mentioning parables is that Sometimes parables are difficult to understand. The inherent nature of the difficulty in understanding a parable causes us to ponder what was said and then to search out to find understanding. And the only way we can do this is by drawing near to the Lord to seek the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in our lives and to reveal this truth, the truth that God is seeking for us to understand. And so the, the idea with, within the concept of the parable because it's difficult to understand, this the very nature of that difficulty causes us to draw near to the Lord and to study His Word so that we can understand. Now, uh, Midrash Tehillim 78, Part 1, it concludes, and it says, For he established a testimony in Jacob, and the law is a prescription for Israel. And the word prescription is uh, from the, the word psalm. And so they ask, what does the word psalm mean? It means that the law which the Holy One, blessed be he, prescribed for the children of Israel is a medicine of life, as it is said, I will be a medicine to your navel. And they quote from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 8. And it's interesting how the rabbis say that the Torah is given as a medicine for life. You know, and we think about that, you know. How, how often do we hear that the law of God, you know, his Torah, his instruction, is a medicine for life? You know, and then we, when we think of medicine, we think of something that is healing, right? And 
Note that the Torah is a reference to all of Scripture, and therefore the conclusion is that God's Word as a whole is meant for healing, is meant for help, for understanding, for comfort, and for peace in the Lord. In addition, we learn about Yeshua the Messiah and the glory of His overcoming death who intercedes on our behalf and of whom Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 states and it says in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the universe the sun is a radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so the author of Hebrews speaks of remembering the scriptures, the prophets, and the power of the word of God, coupled with the concepts of purification for sins that we get from the Torah. And the authors of the apostolic writings understood that God's Torah, his word, is a medicine not only for our souls, but for the remembering of the gift of God and the Messiah Yeshua who died for our sins, in whom we have the forgiveness of sins and all of the promises of God from since the beginning of creation. Okay, so that concludes uh, part one of the Midrash. Next is part four, and Midrash to Helium 78, part four, it opens with the Debor Hamathil, that opening phrase, and it says, Another comment on man did eat angels' food. By man is meant the children of Israel, of whom it is said, Joshua called for every man of Israel. <clears throat> and then the homiletic introduction to the Midrash, it states, By angels' food is meant that they became thereby as mighty as angels. Okay, so the manna, um, it, obviously they're, they're talking about manna, and I didn't think to look at how Part 1 is connected to Part 2, to 3, to 4, and how, why the rabbis are actually starting out discussing the manna. But um, generally, the, each part tends to follow from the previous one. At least that, that's something that I've noticed. And the manna in the scriptures in the Torah, that uh, we, we see that it shows up miraculously every day, except for on the Shabbat. And it's called angel's food. And the rabbis say that the phrase angel's food is meant that the pe people became as mighty as angels. And so then the first question is, how did eating the manna make the people mighty as angels? Because it seems to me that all they did was complain, you know. And what exactly are the rabbis trying to say here? Now, the children of Israel traveled in the wilderness on their way to, to the Mount of Sinai. And while traveling for three days after the dividing of the Red Sea, that uh, there was no food or water, and the result was that they were suffering with thirst. And we read in the Torah, in Exodus chapter 15, verse 24 to 26, it says, So the people grumbled at Mo Moshe, saying, What shall we drink? And then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. There he made for them a statute and a regulation, and there he tested them. And he said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, for I the Lord am your healer. Okay? And so the children of Israel seemed to possess an evil heart of unbelief, you know, because they were always doubting, they were always complaining and grumbling, and they were unwilling to endure the hardships such as hunger and thirst in the wilderness. And um, that hunger and thirst caused them to desire to go back into bondage, you know, into slavery, or to return to Egypt. Now the scriptures say that they were being tested by God to see if they would do what was right before Him. However, when they met, were met with difficulties along the way, they re regarded them as punishment and grumbled against Moshe and the Lord in heaven. Their confidence in God failed, and they could see nothing before them but death. And the, so the Lord worked through the hand of Moshe to sweeten the water so that it was possible to drink. 
However, the people complained, as we read in Exodus 16, verse 2 through 3. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moshe and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Okay, so after this, then the Lord causes men to descend to feed the people, and there does seem to be a significant amount of unbelief in the hearts of the people, but uh, we st still the question is, how did eating manna cause them to be mighty as angels? Okay, why are the rabbis saying that? You know, what are they trying to, what are they trying to say? And uh, this midrash is pretty short. So on page uh, 36, I quote from the entire Midrash. Let me read through that. It says the following. Another comment on man did eat angels' food, but man is meant, by man is meant the children of Israel, of whom it is said Joshua called for every man of Israel, and by angels' food is meant that they became thereby as mighty as angels. Rabbi Simeon, son of Lachish, taught, the children of Israel were troubled, and they said, Can one born of woman eat and not have to void? Have you in your lifetime ever seen a man with a mill in which he puts wheat but does not make flour? The Holy One, blessed be he, said, I so favor the children of Israel that like ministering angels, they have no need to ease themselves. Yet they murmured against me and say, Our souls loathe this light bread, that is, this corrupted bread. How long will this people provoke me, and how long will it be that they believe in me for all the signs which I have performed in their innermost parts, that is, in the intestines and the bowels of Israel, who, though they ate, voided nothing? Rabbi Avihu taught that Jethro arrived in the sixth hour of the day. For his sake, manna enough for the sixty myriads of Israel came down, for this sake enough came down for every organ of each body in Israel. Hence it is said, man did eat the bread of the mighty. He sent provisions to the full. How did the manna come down to the children of Israel? A wind would blow and sweep clean the surface of the ground, making it look like tables of gold and precious stones. And after that the dew would fall for the children of Israel, as it is said. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. And then the children of Israel would come out and gather the manna until the fourth hour of the day before the sun shone upon it and melted it, as it is said, and they gathered it every morning when the sun was hot and melted. Hence it is said, man did eat the bread of the mighty. He caused an east wind to blow, and by his power he brought in the south wind. Okay, so the Midrash shows the rabbis discussing the manna in relation to those who eat of the manna had eaten angels' food, and thus they did not need to ease themselves, or they did not need to void, and um, you know, to go to the bathroom. And this is placed in parallel to the one who places wheat in a mill to make flour, which dictates the natural order order of things. However, the Lord provides bread from heaven, which does not function as bread from earth requiring one to void or, you know, produce excrement. And so the Lord was working miracles in the midst of Israel, and they say that, the rabbis say that he worked miracles in their bowels, their intestines, okay, and making a reference again back to this manna. And yet, if in the midst of all these miracles, that, well, and specifically, this, this isn't mentioned in, in the scripture at all, but um, the the people... Yet, in the midst of this mir these miracles, the, the people maintained rebellion in their hearts. And the rabbis cite Numbers chapter 14, verse 11, and ask why the people do not believe in the Lord when the Lord has performed miracles in their innermost parts. And note how the manna functioned as a miracle to sustain them at the innermost parts, giving people nutrition and strength. Note also how the Lord performs miracles in our midst innermost part in the Messiah Yeshua who comes down from above whose words nourish the soul and who creates in us a newness of heart and of life. It is easy to see the parallels to the Messiah in the work of God to save his people here both in the Torah and in the Apostolic Writings. And, you know, if 
if the anything similar to the Midrash that we're reading here is being taught to the people by the rabbis back in the first century. When Yeshua says that I am the bread that comes down from heaven, it really makes an interesting contrast or comparison to who the Messiah is and what he's he's uh, was claiming who he was claiming to be, you know, or what he was claiming to do, you know, in the midst of the people, you know, and um, that could be also part of the reason why the people, you know, so grossly did not understand what he was trying to say with regard to, uh, you know, the bread from heaven, eating his flesh, drinking his blood, you know, stuff like that, and how it got later misinterpreted to be a, a transubstantiation in, in the Catholic Church. Now, um, the Midrash provides an example of the rabbinic expansion on the Torah text to enhance or to elicit an emotional response to what was taking place in the wilderness. And they say, a wind would blow and sweep clean the surface of the ground, making it look like tables of gold and precious stones. And after that, the dew would fall for the children of Israel, as it is said, and when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. And, um, uh, let's see, Sherry says, How did the rabbis reconcile the passage, can't remember where, about the people going outside the camp to dig and cover the excrement that it shouldn't be done in the camp where he walked among them? I don't know. You know, and um, they tend to gloss over certain things depending on what they're trying to say or the point they're trying to make in the Midrash. And so, um, and generally, when uh, studying the rabbinic literature, the rabbis are trying to draw out a point, and um, there might be very stark contradictions, and but that that's not the point. And the point is this this truth they're trying to tease out of the scriptures, you know. And um, but you know, personally, I don't know how. I'm sure someone would bring that up and ask that question like you did, but um, I don't know. I don't know. And the idea here. In, with regard to what the rabbis are saying is that the Lord is providing an extravagant banquet for the people even turning the, the land into gold tables for the people to eat from in addition the idea of not uh, having to make void or produce excrement is that the excrement is an unclean thing and not having it do so lifts the people up to, or at least it appears to lift the people up to a, a different status, you know. Okay, so um, though the man through the manna they became as angels who do not produce waste like men do here on earth, and thus the people have the opportunity to remain in the presence of God and to study Torah. Okay, and so the rabbinic idea could be that at least this is this was I was thinking um, is that by removing the need to ease oneself one could continue to devote himself to the study of the Torah and to remain in the presence of God and in the concluding phrase it says hence it is said man did eat the bread of the mighty he caused an east wind to blow and by his power he brought in the south wind and um, I really don't have much to say on that concluding phrase I'm not sure what they're talking about and um, the only thing I could come up with is that uh, the reason that they're they're discussing this this eating uh, the man and angels' food is that um, the Lord provided a miracle in their midst. You know, He did this constantly, and that uh, not having to generate waste, you know, and leave the camp, you know, like like you were saying, Sherry, they um, they could remain in the in the presence of God draw near and continue to study Torah. That, that, that's about all I could I, I could really come up with out of that. Um, you know, I'd, so I'm within the limited time that I had to, to look at this. Now, um, and that was the end of uh, part four. Now part six, it opens with the Debor Hamad heel and it says, For all this they sinned still and believed not in his wondrous works. And the context is found in the miracles the Lord performed when delivering Israel from bondage in Egypt and those he performed in dividing of the Red Sea and the water and the manna while the people were traveling to Sinai. The homiletic introduction to the Midrash it states that Rabbi Berechiah, Rabbi Levi, Rabbi Simeon, son of Josie, taught in the name of Rabbi Mir, 
that the Holy One blessed be he, let Jacob see a ladder upon which Babylon climbed up seventy rungs and came down. Medea climbed up fifty-two rungs and came down. Greece climbed up a hundred and eighty rungs and came down. But when Edom climbed higher than these, Jacob saw and was afraid. Okay, and so um, the, the question, what is the purpose of saying these nations climbed the ladder in Jacob's dream in Parashat Toledot? You know, and the rabbis comment upon the psalmist's words how the people did not believe in the Lord even in the midst of the miracles of God. Notice how the same thing happened in the midst of the people um, when Yeshua the Messiah performed miracles. Okay, so the occurrence of a miracle does not necessarily, necessarily elicit faith in those who are not the children of God or even those who, who do not believe. This is what the rabbis are attempting to draw out, I felt, in their comments upon the children of Israel in the wilderness who believed not in his wondrous works. These nations at one point or another believed in the God of, a in the God of Israel. And look at how, he, like, how the Lord used the king of Babylon. It says in Daniel chapter 4, Let Nebuchadnezzar become wet with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the animals among the plants of the earth. And so because of Nebuchadnezzar's bragging about himself and his own glory, the Lord humbled him. And in following the appointed number of years that he was humbled, then uh, the, the Lord had ordained for his humbling. Nebuchadnezzar then came back to his senses and he gave glory to the Lord God of Israel. And so the rabbis say that Babylon climbed 70 rungs up the ladder and as a result of this. And, and the uh, notice that Edom climbed the highest of them all higher than 180 rungs and it says that Jacob was afraid and this is not um, this is a reference to Esau I felt that who is uh, the father of Edom Esau received all of his father Israel's wealth but yet he did not value the covenant of God and did not value the promises of God and uh, then the Midrash it continues and it says the following we're on the bottom of page 38 if you're wondering um, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to him, Therefore, fear not, O Jacob, my servant. Even as the former fell, so will the latter fall. When the Holy One, blessed be he, said to Jacob, You climb up also. But Jacob said, Master of the universe, I am afraid, lest I will have to come down. And the Holy One, blessed be he, said, God's mercy, no. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, says the Lord. You will not have to come down, O Israel. Where is the proof that the Holy One, blessed be he, let our father Jacob see the temple built? Seized the sacrificial gifts, offered up, priests performing their holy service, and finally, the presence departing. In the verse, and he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. No dream is without meaning. Thus the ladder represents the temple. The top of it reached to heaven alludes to the sacrificial gifts, whose savor, when offered up, reaches the heaven, reaches heaven. The angels of God ascending and descending on it represents the priests who as they ascend and descend the ramp are called angels as is said for the priest is the angel of the Lord of hosts. Finally, behold, the Lord stood beside him has the same force as the verse I saw the Lord standing beside the altar. And um, a quote from Amos chapter 9. And, okay, so that was from the Midrash. And the rabbis, they conclude that Jacob climbed higher than all the other nations, but more than this, the Lord did not require Jacob to climb down, back down the ladder. The rising up of the ladder remain, rem, and remaining is compared to the Lord showing Jacob the temple and the sacrificial gifts offered up, the priests performing their, their service, etc. The ladder signifies the connection between heaven and earth, in which the rabbis interpret in the Midrash as the prayers in the smoke of the sacrifices offered in the holy temple where the solidifying factors that connected the Lord God in heaven with Israel. Note also another interpretation may be that the latter alludes to the giving of the Torah as another connection between heaven and earth, God's instruction for his people that is descended from heaven. Remember um, Parashat HaZinu that we, we, did, we talked about how Moshe calls heaven and earth to bear witness 
and of his instruction, you know, and in of the Torah. And the idea that the Torah was from since the beginning of creation, even before creation, and that it came down from heaven to earth, God gave it to us, and um, without change in shape or form. And so, um, also, it's interesting to note how Yeshua used this example in John chapter 1, I think verse 51 to 53, somewhere around in there. But um, that Yeshua refers to himself as the latter and the angels of heaven ascending and descending upon him. And what's really interesting is that, and I don't think I, I talked about that here, but um, what's interesting is that all of these concepts I believe Yeshua was drawing upon in his description of who he is, and especially with regard to John describing how he understood who Yeshua was. You know, it says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was God, and, you know, the Word of God was with God, and that the Word became flesh, you know, etc. And that uh, Yeshua is the Word become flesh. And then you have this, the Torah, you know, the descending from heaven. You have the it being the medicine for our soul. It, you know, I mean, it, it, I, it's just amazing the kind of uh, the kind of details that the 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 rabbinic concepts that are drawn into John chapter one, just based on what even what we're studying here. Now, in the interpretation on the latter alluding to the giving of Torah. In this interpretation, it's significant that the Hebrew word for latter, sulam, and the name for the mountain to, from which the Torah was given, Sinai, had the same gematria, or numerical value of the letters. And the gematria is a system that assigns numerical value to a word or phrase in the belief that the words or phrases with identical numerical values bear some relation to one another. Okay, so, granted, you know, the rabbis use the gematria sometimes to really, you know, stretch the interpretation, but I thought that that was a really interesting connection here with regard to the latter and Sinai, the giving of Torah that descended, you know, and the Word of God in Yeshua. You know, I, have this, I think that's just really fascinating. And bear in mind that the numerical values being equal does not solidify the connection between the latter and Sinai. The better interpretation would be taken from the meaning of the text of the angels ascending and descending, the connection between heaven and earth, and that place, Mount Moriah, upon which there is a connection to the Lord, which is found in the temple services and prayer, and to Moshe ascending and descending on Sinai, etc. I think that right out of the biblical text, even, we can, we can get a more solid interpretation than um, using the gematria, but still it is an interesting, uh, an interesting connection there. The Midrash states specifically saying, thus the ladder represents the temple. The top of it reached the heaven alludes to the sacrificial gifts whose savor when offered up reaches heaven. Angels of God ascending and descending on it represents the priest who as they ascended and descend the ramp are called angels, as is for the priests as the angel of the Lord of hosts. A quote from Malachi chapter 2. The New Testament interpretation for this may also be found in Revelation chapter 8 verse 4, which states um, in verse 1 through 4 and in chapter 8, When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And all this, I saw this, the seven angels who stood before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hands. Okay? And so, and that was Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. So here we find the prayers and the temple service, specifically in the, the offering of the incense is connected to the prayers of God's people going up before the throne of God. This is the very same uh, conceptual idea that the rabbis are using right here in the Midrash. In Now in Midrash Tehillim 76, part 6, it concludes and it says, Rabbi Josi, son of Zimra, in the name of Rabbi Simeon, son of Josi, taught that Rabbi Mir took the verse, For all this they sinned still and believed not in his wondrous works to mean that 
If Jacob had climbed up the ladder, he would not have had to come down again, and we would not now be suffering in the present slavery. Okay, so um, the final conclusion was that Jacob did not climb the ladder. That's what it seems to be with regard to the last part of the Midrash. And the significance is that of climbing or seeking the Lord and the importance of prayer and the temple service before the Lord. The people did not find value in the presence of God in their midst, which was evidenced by the miracles the Lord had performed before them and saved them from their enemies. How important is prayer in the service of the Lord in your life today, in our lives today? And how important is the presence of God in our lives today? Uh, if these things are not important to you, to seek the Lord in repentance and humility before Him, the Lord will bring calamity, I believe that, for the purpose of drawing us back and drawing us near to Him. And then the question is, is that if, if we are going through calamity, you know, if there's something that's happening, hardships and trials today, then um, like a continuance of illness or a weakness, this may be for the purpose of remaining strong in the Messiah Yeshua, like, like uh, Paul had uh, written of with regard to his affirmity, that the Lord said that, I, that he is strong in the Messiah. And this was the point that Paul made for the Lord, I believe, for not healing his eyes. And there may be reasons for calamity or things happening to us, but we do not always receive the answers why, which is the reason we are to continue to seek the Lord and to do what is right as we walk before Him. You know? And um, I believe that's what it meant in Numbers when Moshe said that the Lord was testing you, that uh, you would to see if you would do, or you continue to do what is right. When bad things come, do we make the right decisions to do what is right, or do we just say the heck with it? and, you know, not care. You know, I think that God is looking at that, looking at our hearts to see if that we are we are being true to Him. And um, I need help. I need help for that. You know, I, I pray for that. The Lord would help me to remain true because uh, that's, that's hard, you know. So that concludes part uh, six of the Midrash. Um, part eight, it opens with the Debor Hamad heel and it says, but he, being full of compassion, gives iniqui iniquity and destroys not. Yes, many a time does he turn his anger away and does not stir up all his wrath. And then the, the homiletic introduction to the Midrash states, These words are to be considered in the light of, of the verse, O Lord, correct me, but in measure. Okay, so the idea is that, the Lord, that God's children have the realization that they have sinned and need the mercy of God and the forgiveness of their sins. The consequences do not always disappear, even though our sins are forgiven by God. And part 8 is a, is a really short midrash, so I list the entire midrash on page 40 here. Yeah, you know, Ellie says that when bad things happen, many people I know run away from the Lord rather than to Him. And yeah, yeah I, I, know, I have known people who've done both. You know, they run, they draw nearer, they become more humble. And I've, I've seen people who become just, you know, completely done with, with God. You know, I, I don't understand that. But um, it almost seems like when things go good, then you're happy. When things go bad, I'm done. You know, and I, that's just not the way things are supposed to work. But on page 40 here, I, I list the entire Midrash. It says the following. But he, being full of compassion, gives iniquity and destroys not. Yes, many a time does he turn his anger away and does not stir up all his wrath. These words are to be considered in the light of the verse, O Lord, correct me, but, ach, in measure. Rabbi Judah, son of Simon, taught that ach, but, the word but, is a disjunctive signifying restraint. Hence, here, he destroyed not, says, many a time does he turn his anger away, and does not stir up all of his wrath, means that God stirs up not all of his wrath, but stirs up only a part of his wrath. So he rem remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes away and comes not again. 
Is this word or is this verse to be taken as confirmation of the notion people have that the dead will not be resurrected? That flesh is a wind that passes away and comes not again? God forbid. This verse refers to the inclination to evil which passes away with a man at the time of death and will not return with him at the time that the dead are resurrected. How often did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert with their demands for manna, for quail, for water from the well, and with other provocations? And what was to be their end? In this wilderness they will be consumed, and there they will die. But even as they were consumed in the wilderness, so will they be com comforted in the wilderness, for it is said, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Okay, so um, the rabbis focus on the word ach, meaning hardly or scarcely in relation to uh, the word mishpat, meaning judgment, which is translated as to judge in measure. The rabbis interpret this word to mean that the Lord restrains himself from destroying due to sin. The concept here is that the mercy of God causes only a portion of his wrath to come and not the full measure. The reason is that he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes away and comes not. And they're, they're quoting here from Psalm 78 verse 39. The weakness of the body in this world is that we die away and pass away. And this is interpreted as the inclination to evil which passes away with a man at the time of death and will not return with him at the time when the desert or dead are resurrected. And notice how the rabbis say that the Yetzer Hara will pass away with the death of the body. The Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination, is connected to the flesh. It is not necessarily a spiritual malady. At least that, that's what it seems to be that they're saying here in the Midrash. The interesting thing, though, is that there is a distinction that is made between the righteous and the unrighteous in the world to come in the Tanakh. And in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, and but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Okay, so Daniel 12, verse 2, makes a distinction between the righteous and the unrighteous after the resurrection. And the scripture does not say that they will be raised in the lust of their flesh, but that in disgrace and everlasting contempt or shame, meaning that their sins were not forgiven and that they will bear their guilt before God and men for all of eternity. Midrash Tehillim 78 Party, it concludes, it says, But even as they were consumed in the wilderness, so will they be comforted in the wilderness, for it is said, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness, or in... Uh, yeah, into the wilderness and speak comfor comfortably unto her. So the verse, and they're quoting from Hosea chapter 2 verse 16, and the verse from Hosea appears to, ju to suggest that the Lord will call upon his people to draw them back to himself. And this is what happens to us today, I believe, and the Lord calls out to our hearts, and if we are willing, we answer the call. And so um, when bad things happen, it could be the Lord alluring us and calling us back to Him. And so I think that it's an important part of our uh, walk before God, of our faith, is in um, being sensitive to this idea that the Lord is seeking us and that He is, he is drawing us to Him. You know. Okay, so that concludes uh, part 8. Part 18 of the Midrash it states, it opens with the Deborah Mahiel, and it says it, and I'm on the bottom of page 40. In the verse, and he brought them to the border of his sanctuary in uh, to this mountain which his right hand had gotten. The homiletic introduction to the Midrash, it states, Sanctuary refers to the holy temple. He drove out the nations before them and allotted them for an inheritance by line and made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents that is, in the tents of the 31 kings of Canaan. Okay, so again, this Midrash is pretty short. On page 41, I list the entire thing. Let me read through it. I'll start from the beginning. 
in the verse, and he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, to this mountain which his right hand had gotten. Sanctuary refers to the holy temple. He drove out the nations before them, and allotted them for an inheritance by line, and made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents, that is, in the tents of the thirty-one kings of Canaan. He forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men. Both Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Josie, son of Hananiah, taught the following. Since one verse speaks of the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men, while another verse speaks of it as the house of the Lord in Shiloh, therefore the lower portion of the sanctuary in Shiloh must have been built of stones with coverings or goat's hair for a roof. According to Rabbi Zerah, the lower portion of the sanctuary in Shiloh was built of boards since it is called the tabernacle Shiloh, Shiloh and delivered his strength into captivity. His strength was the Ark of the Covenant. The fire devoured their young, devoured Nadav and Avihu. Abba Hanan said Nadav and Avihu were boastful men, for they said, What woman is worthy of us? We are the sons of the high priest. Our uncle Moshe is king. Our grandfather is a prince. What woman can possibly be worthy of us? According, accordingly, the fire devoured their young men. Why? Because their virgins had no marriage song. Their priests fell by the sword. That is, Hophni and Phinehas fell. Then the Lord will awaken as one out of sleep. Rabbi Berechiah said in the name of Rabbi Eliezer, Before the time of redemption comes, the Holy One, blessed be he, makes himself out to be asleep. But if one may dare speak thus, the Lord will awaken as one out of sleep. Indeed, when the time of redemption comes, God will be like a mighty man recovering from wine. Okay, and um, so the Midrash, uh, there's a lot of concepts they're bringing in here. And the Midrash continues, and it says that the Lord caused Israel to dwell in the tents of the kings of Canaan. And it goes on to say that the Lord forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh. And the rabbis expand upon the Mashal and the parable and weave in the concepts with regard to the construction materials of the tabernacle. Korach and Nadav and Avihu dying, being consumed by fire. They say that the strength of God was the Ark of the Covenant. And, you know, how was the Ark of the Covenant the strength of God? And if we look at Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 41, it says, Now therefore arise, O Lord God, into thy resting place, thou in the Ark of thy strength. Let thy priest, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. Let thy saints rejoice in goodness. The scriptures state explicitly that the ark was the strength of God. The ark of your strength is most likely a reference to its use in war. The ark is called by several names. Sometimes it's referred to as the ark. In other places it's referred to, and I give a bunch of references here, if you want to dig into that a little deeper. Other places the ark is referred to as the ark of the testimony, the ark um, of the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and the Ark wherein is the Covenant of the Lord, which he made with our fathers when he brought out of the land of Egypt, or and also the Ark wherein is the Covenant of the Lord that he made with the children of Israel. And then also um, there's another description, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth. Okay, And so the Ark of the Covenant is supposed to have contained the Ten Commandments, a copy of the Torah, and Aaron's staff that budded. And all these are testimony to his glory and the work that he'd done to deliver Israel from bondage. The names of the ark is a representation of the testimony of God, and therefore the Lord worked mighty miracles while the ark was present in Israel. The ark, by reason of its prominence in the Bible, forms an important subject of discussion by the rabbis, and as a result, there are many sayings related to the ark of the covenant of God in the, in the Talmud, in the Midrashim. They discuss the dimensions, Position, material, contents, miraculous powers, final disposition, and various incidences directly or indirectly connected to the ark. You know, just even, you know, in of the tabernacle, like what we can see here in this midrash in part 18, that uh, in how it's constructed. And in addition to all of these things, are weaved into the narrative of popular Jewish legends and are also of interest as reflecting 
the poetical spirit in which many of the rabbis functioned as teachers and instructors and leaders. In Midrash Tehillim 78, part 18, the, drab- the rabbis draw upon these things to illustrate God's ability and power to deliver his people and to bring them to the mountain of Sinai, of which they call the border of his sanctuary. And note that the sanctuary is connected to Jacob's ladder and the ascending and descending of the angels and of Moshe upon the mountain. You know, if we if we look at the other Midrash within uh, this section on Psalm 78. This ascending and descending imagery imagery is illustrated in the rabbi saying that Moshe ascended into heaven to receive God's Torah and to bring it down to man on earth. And these things are then paralleled to the land of Israel, to Mount Moriah, and the temple in Jerusalem. God's strength is found in his ability to shape history, nations, and men, even in the midst of their disobedience before him, as is found in the case of his own people, and even in those who are not even the children of God, like we see in in the case of Nebuchadnezzar. God raised this nation up for the purpose of of um, chastising Israel and then dragging her into captivity. He said he could bring her back. And um, I believe that Jeremiah prophesied that there will be a day that will come. Well, it'll say, Bless is the Lord God in heaven who delivered Israel from the land of the north rather than from Mitzrayim, right? And so um, there was a, a prophetic fulfillment there as well that uh, in the Lord raising up this nation to chastise Israel for her sins. Now, um, so God has this ability to shape history, nations and men, even in the midst of their disobedience before him. And in the concluding phrase in part 18 here of the Midrash, Rabbi Berachai said in the name of Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer, before the time of redemption comes, the Holy One, blessed be he, makes himself out to be asleep. If one may dare speak thus, the Lord will awaken as one out of sleep. Indeed, when the time of redemption comes, God will be like a mighty man recovering from wine. Okay, so well, th- this is an interesting description of the Lord. When the Lord wakes out of being asleep, does he awake being angry from being awakened? Or is he in a happy state from the wine? You know, and the idea is that uh, I know that, I mean, myself, you know, if I'm really tired and someone's making a lot of noise and I get upset, I mean, I, anyone get upset, try not to, you know, but um, you get a little upset from being awakened from sleep and uh, interrupting that sleep. And so the idea might be that, uh, no, I mean, he hasn't done that. I don't, I don't generally sleep when he's up because I want to spend time with him. And he goes to bed by 7.30, so... Um, <laughs> So yeah, no, I don't, I don't generally sleep when he's up. I I just stay up. But um, uh, okay, so the move, okay, so the move of the Lord in our lives should not be by reason of our sins to draw us back to Himself. Rather, we are supposed to live righteously, and by reason of our calling out, um, and not by reason of our sins. Anyway, let me reread this here. The move of the Lord in our lives should not be by the reason of our sins to draw us back to himself. Rather, we are supposed to live righteously, and by reason of our calling out to the Lord in righteousness and humility, should the Lord move. Okay, And our sins should not go up as a cry before the Lord, as what had happened in Parashat Noah. The idea here is in the Midrash is that the Lord has set an appointed time for the redemption of his people. The illustration of the Lord God being like a mighty man recovering from wine may be by reason that it appears the Lord is unconcerned or not moving on behalf of the people for a period of time. Similar to the disregard of the person who is enamored with alcohol who doesn't care but simply wants to lay around and sleep. So it seems though that this illustration is not quite correct in that the Lord tarries for righteousness sake in order to see whether his people will continue to do what is right even in the midst of the appearance that the Lord is not moving, healing or um, saving okay and so 
I, I felt that um, the Lord tarries because uh, in order to generate or elicit faith in our lives so that we will draw near to Him and seek why He tarries, right? Okay, so that, that concluded part 21 of the Midrash. And, um, you know, um, Ellie, regarding Lucas, he sleeps 11 and a half hours at night, every night. He, since the third month, three and a half months old, he's, he sleeps really good. And um, I, we're blessed by that. We're tremendously blessed like that. So uh, he doesn't get up till 7, you know. And um, But he's in his crib still. We don't have him in a real bed yet. And um, I'm not sure when we'll move him out. And he hasn't got to the point yet where he calls out to us. I'm sure that'll come here in a few months. He hasn't quite got it yet, but he's, he's saying a lot. He's um, make, putting sentences, starting to put sentences together and stuff, which is pretty cool. But um, but yeah, we're, we're really blessed. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, ten hours. That is a blessing, isn't it? <laughs> And so, okay, so um, in part 21 is the last part of the Midrash we're looking at. It opens with the Debor Hamat heel and it says, He chose David also his servant and took him because of his separations of the sheep. And in the homiletic introduction to the Midrash, it states, Rabbi Joshua, the priest, taught what is meant by the phrase, his separations. So the rabbis say that it is by reason that David separated the sheep, he tended in a particular way that caused the Lord to choose him. And it might be that he chose to be tender and kind to the sheep that he took care of. The Lord, the Lord saw the intention of his heart and chose David because he knew that he would remain faithful all of his life. Now, um, again, this Midrash is really short. And so on page 43, I give the entire Midrash. Let me read through it here. He chose David also his servant and took him because of his separations of the sheep. Rabbi Joshua, the, high, the priest, taught what is meant by the phrase his separations. It means that David kept some sheep sh separate from others. He would lead out the lambs and let them feed on the upper part of the herbage. He would then lead out the rams and let them feed on the middle part of the herbage. And finally, he would lead out the old ewes and let them feed on the scuffle of the herbage. According to the Holy One, blessed be he, said, Seeing that David knows how to feed the sheep, let, let him come and feed my sheep, the people of Israel, of whom it is said, As for you, my sheep. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Rabbi Abba, who said in the name of Rabbi Jonathan, uh, or Yo Johanan, Johanan uh, David said to the other David set to the other of priestly watches in such a way that in years of jubilee, one priestly watch should not take over a second field of possession before a sister watch had the opportunity to take over one field of possession. Rabbi Yudan said, after David had praised the Holy One, blessed be he, with all kinds of praise in an acrostic psalm, what did he finally say? He said, my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, Psalm 145, verse 21. These are the very words which he began his psalm in praise of the Holy One, blessed be he. Okay, so that concludes the Midrash. And so the rabbis expand upon the mashal, saying that he would lead out the ram lambs and le let them feed on the upper part of the herbage. He would lead out the rams and let them feed on the middle. And then the old ewes, he would them, let them feed on the scuffle. Okay, and so why does... David caused these different animals to feed on different parts of the grass. And it may be that this is a reference to the lambs having sensitive stomachs and thus need only the most tender portions of the food. The uh, lambs might be uh, new believers. They might be people that does need the milk of the word. You know, if we, we consider it in, in that kind of context. The um, the rams are more robust and they're able to eat the middle portion, the stiffer stalks of the herbage. And then the older ewes are more experienced as the one who is spiritually experienced and able to eat the meat of the word. And um, it looks like there's a typo, typo here. It says meat of the world. I, I think I meant the meat of the word as compared to the one who is young and new to the faith who requires milk as opposed to meat. 
And um, we, you, we can remember that. Hebrews chapter 10, uh, the author of Hebrews talks about that. And so this may be the point the rabbis are drawing out in the Midrash, which is indicated by the rabbis saying that the Lord chose David because he knows how to feed the sheep as a reference to the people of Israel. Midrash to Hilim 78, part 21, concludes saying, He said, My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. These are the very words with which he began his psalm in praise of the Holy One, blessed be he. So the Midrash speaks of David leading the people and composing his psalms. David praised the Lord with all kinds of praises. Yeshua the Messiah said that David spoke of him as the Messiah of Israel, which was foretold by the Jewish prophets. This was the early understanding of who Yeshua was and is the reason why the Canaanite woman came to him saying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me in Matthew chapter 15 verse 22 for healing of her demon-possessed child and why the blind man cried out, Yeshua, son of David, have mercy on me in Luke 18 verse 38 to be healed of his sight. David is connected to the Messiah as a teacher, a prophet, a priest, and a king. And today we are able to give our praises to, our, to the Lord God our Father in heaven because of Yeshua Messiah, our Savior, King, and Lord. Okay, so that, that concludes the study on the Midrash. And I, I really ran out of time on part 21 because we looked at a lot of parts here, so I had to kind of wrap it up. But uh, let me close in prayer and then I'll open the mic if anyone has any comments. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the miracles that you've shown us every day and that the way of the salvation that you have provided. Lord, we recognize that the scriptures were given as a way to remember your great and mighty works so that we may li live with the hope of your deliverance daily. Help us, Lord, to be overcomers in this world, to live for your glory and not for our own. Lord, we thank you for the promises you have made to your in your continued faithfulness to your promises that you have made so long ago. Lord, help us to keep our feet on the path of righteousness and truth according to your word and also to have the desire to walk in your ways. Thank you for giving us the faith to believe in Yeshua the Messiah and for always calling our hearts back to you. Lord, please have mercy on us. Forgive us of our sins. And we thank you, Lord, for sending your son Yeshua that we may enter into the covenant of peace that you promised to your people. Help us to grow in our faith, to walk in the Spirit, and to apply these truths to our lives. And we praise your holy name, and we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise forever and ever. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay.